So, um, hi everyone, uh, good afternoon, and welcome to my PhD dissertation defense presentation, which is titled Building Robust Human Activity Recognition Models from Unlabeled Data. Uh, I'm Abu Zaid Faridi, and I work with Dr. Nirmala Roy in Mobile Pervasive and Sensor Computing Lab at UMBC. And I sincerely thank you all, especially the committee members, Dr. Roy, Dr. Mishra, Dr. Gangopadhyay, Dr. Pan, and Dr. Foles for your valuable time. So this is going to be the um, overall organization of our presentation today. Um, we start with the motivation for wearable sensor-based human activity recognition, and we discuss some of the challenges in this avenue, and that is mainly the heterogeneities in the inertial human activity recognition data. Um, we give a brief overview of our thesis in the next section and summarize our contribution. We review the literature and limitations that we are trying to address. Uh, we then give another brief, brief tour on the data set and a little bit of on the pre-processing pipeline that we do to classify the um, uh, inertial samples. And then we actually introduce three methods of increasing complexity to handle these heterogeneities. The first method is on improve the basic classification with limited label samples. Then the second method is a little bit more advanced, handle positional and personal heterogeneities. And the third method is handle complex mixture of domain space heterogeneities. And from all these results, um, all these methods and their results, we draw our conclusion. Um, yeah, so let's start on the motivation. Uh, why do we need wearable sensor-based human activity recognition? Well, the proliferation of low-cost wearable sensors and IoT devices have created a lot of innovative ML application choices over the last few years. We have um, interesting applications in healthcare, sports analytics, fitness monitoring, entertainment, and also in skill acquisition training. Now, compared to vision or depth sensing, um, the initial sensors uh, actually offer more flexibility uh, in terms of unconstrained movement. You, you can have a large action space. You can just uh, have one sensor placed or one or two sensors placed on your body. You can just run around and you'll be have uh, you'll be collecting the data. Um, and also a little bit of privacy preservation aspects because it's just uh, collecting your movement data, not you know uh, you know not your face or your body postures. So those things actually provide a uh, nice alternative to vision or depth sensing. However, there are some trade-offs. There are personal and heterogeneous streams due to the variation in age, sex, dexterity, and personal training levels. So let's take a deeper look at the challenges. Uh, apart from the personal heterogeneities uh, that we already talked about, we can also have cross-position heterogeneity or cross-device heterogeneity. For example, say, you have a smart uh, smartphone and say for five years you have been using that and you know it, it can correctly classify all of your activities for and then you decide to get a smartwatch and uh, you and you probably want to leave the smartphone behind so now and you want to have you don't want to collect more data you don't want to build a new uh, classification model you the expectation is you will continue using that uh, smart device uh, to um, uh, classify your activities. Now you have only, you, by doing that, you have only, um, you have introduced two heterogeneities. One is the cross position heterogeneity. Maybe the phone was in your back pocket and now you have a wristwatch. Also the sensor itself can be different. The, each of the sensors have their own sensitivity. They clamp sometimes uh, the accelerometers um, readings. Um, they, they can have their own signal processing. So. From a statistical standpoint, uh, the distribution of the samples can uh, uh, introduce the heterogeneities or they can change. The mar we can say that the marginal distribution can change. That means the raw sample distribution or the conditional distribution can also change. That is the uh, label distribution with respect to the sample distribution. And heterogeneities actually um, affect uh, both. Also, the activities can itself be different. We can have natural activities like activities of daily living, or you can also have specialized activities, something like a dance. Now, natural activities of daily living, those are not, uh, you know, uh, as the definition suggests, their natural precision is not warranted, easier to collect and annotate long swaths of walking, running, or standing data, 
and a little bit lower personal in vari uh, variability, but it's still there. But on the other hand, we have special act specialized activities such as dance, which are learned rhythmic movements. And these are highly art articulated and choreographed movements. And these are consciously precise. And there is a learning con uh, component involved. Label windows are much shorter. Labels can expire if your training or dexterity level change. And across persons, they are like, they widely vary. So these are some of the challenges. So in order to understand those challenges, we um, we actually started a pilot study back in 2000, uh, I think 18. Um, and the objective was that rather than just going about and just try out some public data, uh, we just started to curate our own data set on a specialized activity, uh, build a preliminary activity recognition framework um, with deep learning and then get a first hand ex experience of the heterogeneity. So we designed a data collection protocol on Monipuri dance uh, with 10 different dance steps, four sensors in each limb collected at 100 hertz. And we had five uh, person, one instructor and four beginning students and trained a three um, layer convolutional classifier. And the results were like very interesting. When we trained on the same person and then tested on some held out data on the same person, we would of, often get like really high um, accuracy. And this was also true if we also used um, the same sensor and then tested on the same sensor. So you would see that, you know, 91, sometimes 80, but it's, it's more than 76. But whenever you change the, you know, um, uh, uh, try to classify across persons or classify across the sensors, the accuracy would drop. So that was our first glimpse into this, uh, these challenges of heterogeneities. And, and actually it motivated us to actually uh, seek out how to handle those uh, heterogeneities. Now there are two simple ways. The, one of them is actually simple. Just go about and collect more data, annotate them and build a much robust classifier. But that is not, uh, that is boring and, uh, uh, you know, that is uh, also like very uh, time consuming and, you know, resource consuming. So we said, okay, let's see what we can do from a machine learning perspective. And that provides the motivation for the rest of all, all the other contributions of our thesis. So the thesis, um, um, before we start our thesis um, overview, let's, uh, we, we outline these core research questions. So how, and we wanted to actually scale the activity recognition models without collecting more uh, labeled samples, right? So how do we scale activity recognition models across heterogeneities with limited label samples? Can a model learn a good feature representation from more readily available unlabeled samples? Uh, another question was, can we interpret this learned representation to find the reasons behind those heterogeneities? And um, does the metadata labels about the heterogeneity, for example, gender, position, or device model labels, carry any extra information to improve the activity level classification performance? And if so, how to best integrate such semantic information into the human activity recognition pipeline? And uh, lastly, how to handle multiple heterogeneities present in the samples at the same time. So these are the core research questions that we try to address. So we uh, increase, uh, we, uh, um, the contribution of this thesis can be summarized in like four, um, four ideas and we have nicknamed them each of them. So in Happy Feet, uh, which I already discussed, we curate our own data set and build a simple convolutional classifier. In our next work, OctoVac, we improve the classification with limited label samples. And then in Strangan, we actually start going into more complexity. So handle a positional and personal heterogeneities uh, with a domain adaptation framework. And then in CodeM, our last contribution, we handle a complex mixture of this domain space heterogeneity. And as you can see, uh, as the years went by, we actually moved from uh, application space to a little bit on the machine learning space. The contributions are more in the machine, uh, centric on the machine learning. And also that our beginning paper was, beginning two papers was more on the specialized activities such as dance. As we were, as years went by, we moved on to natural activities such as ADL. Um, the actual reason for that is, based, uh, the, is that the availability of uh, benchmark data sets, uh, because 
and comparability with other state-of-the-art learning me methods, which were also um, uh, benchmarked against those uh, public data sets. So uh, it's more of a practical choice than actual, uh, you know, design de uh, decision. So to summarize our thesis statement, uh, this thesis is focused on building scalable machine learning models for human activity recognition that are robust against domain shifts with minimal to no extra level information and discover the optimum transferability of the representation between the domains. And we developed novel, deep, unsupervised, self-supervised, adversarial representation learning, a little bit uh, um, hint on the meta learning as well and learnable data augmentation techniques. So before we go um, more on the, uh, on, on the next slides, let's define domain and task uh, here because I have used this term domain shift already. A domain is defined as a tuple of a feature space X and the marginal probability distribution um, of that. And a task is actually defined by the label space Y and the predictive function F, which takes the input on, of X and predicts the Y. Now, if we say that there is a domain shift, that is DS and DT are not same, that implies that either the feature space are not same or the marginal probability distributions will differ. When, if we say the tasks are different, then actually means that either the label space is different or the conditional distribution is actually different. Now, based on this definition, uh, we can actually define the taxonomy of our work. And as you can see that, um, the in happy fit work was actually uh, present um, uh, was done from a usual learn, uh, learn, um, machine learning perspective, but then we realized that we need much more sophisticated things to handle the heterogeneities. So all our work in Octovax, Triangle, and Podium actually falls under the domain adaptation categorization. So here is also the breakdown of the contribution in terms of the representation learning architectures. Um, as it's the uh, same thing from a, from a different perspective. We moved on to domain adaptation. Later, Stangen was, uh, we were using adversarial learning and then in Podem we were using contrastive learning and uh, some other techniques as well. So let's review the previous work and how our um, own work stacks against it. So how to deal with the la lack of annotated samples? We are just reviewing that part of the literature and there are different ways to do it. One thing is just do data augmentation, but the augmentation parameters are generally found with trial and error. And as I, I will show you that we also had our own fair share of troubles with it um, and also some good results. Uh, you can also do self-supervised learning. Uh, it, is, it is on the rage nowadays in uh, computer vision tasks, um, and, but it requires carefully designed proxy tasks to be effective. Uh, Semi-supervised learning can also be used, but it, it assumes that there is no domain shift. So if there is a domain shift, then um, you have to bring in something more sophisticated, and that is what domain adaptation is. And this is a much, uh, th there is a much rich literature that uh, I talk about in the write-up of the thesis, but I just skim through it. Um, mainly there are um, multiple approach, but they can be uh, formalized into feature al alignment based approaches or adversarial approaches. But some of the drawbacks are that if you are trying to do domain adaptation, it's you, you are still required to uh, design a well-trained source uh, uh, domain classifier from where you can actually transfer the knowledge. But if you, what if you don't have enough information to, sorry, build a low, robust source domain classifier? That is something that we have tried to address in one of our works. These uh, models also lack interpretability. Uh, and also they also require synchronous data collection across domains. And uh, most recently, um, they, are, they do not actually handle, um, you know, a complex mixture of domains, which ha we have tried to address in some of our later works. Here's a small uh, um, recap of the datasets and pre-processing pipeline. So if we have multiple sensors, then we will do, um, we'll collect them together. We'll do a time step synchronization. We'll do the annotation by ourselves uh, if required. And then since we are using convolutional architectures throughout all of our works, then we'll uh, need uh, to use a sliding window protocol. It's because the convolutional architectures, uh, even like uh, modern RNN architectures that are being used, they expect a fixed size window. So normally like a two or three seconds of window how many samples uh, it's there. And 
you you can actually take non overlapping windows but having overlapping window increases the generalizability to some extent we have seen that and after that you can in, uh, use the deep learning pipeline these are the five data sets that we have used in all of our experiments the first data set is the uh, data set i was talking about in the uh, beginning slide that is the happy fit dance activity recognition data set uh, that was curated by us and the rest of four are all public data sets and you can see that there is a variation in the body position and the number of subjects and you know their genders um, and the labels are also uh, you know uh, quite varied some of them have skewed label distributions while others have like more balanced distribution so our coming back to our contribution so our first contribution was improved classification with limited label samples right so we were trying to say, uh, as, as I have um, uh, spoken earlier, that we wanted to use the unlabeled data to um, learn a good representation. So that was one of our uh, uh, point of uh, this uh, research direction. And we increased uh, at that moment, we thought, OK, can we actually use data augmentation to approximate the personal variability of the movements? So use case one is that we assume that there is no heterogeneity involved in, in, that, um, uh, in that incoming data streams. That means that we can actually use self-supervised or semi-supervised learning. So um, in that, in that um, um, spirit, what we did was we created this network. You can see that this is a, uh, you know, uh, we have a domain normalizer. It will come, uh, I will explain this later, but um, uh, let's keep it for now. We have a data augmentation pipeline, and then we extract the features, and then we have a reconstruction objective. So what we do here is that transform the input samples with random rotation, time wrapping, scaling, and deter transform, uh, augment, uh, deter transformation, and we we have a self supervision task to re reconstruct the original input, input from the transformed samples. So the encoder um, learns transformation invariant representation. So that is robust against intrapersonal uh, variability. So within a person, like all the variation that I can make from say few of my walking samples, that was the idea. And then train a classifier with the limited labels on the encoder. So uh, this is, um, you can train them, uh, you can train that top part first and then you can train the bottom part or you can train them together. Um, we saw that, you know, training them together actually, you know, increases the generalizability. Now, what happens if you have a domain shift? Like say you have two persons of data and you probably have say one person, uh, you only have data on one person or limited data. And now for the second person, you don't have enough information. Um, sorry, enough label samples. So then we actually create a copy of the uh, same architecture for one for source domain, one for target domain. Source domain is trained and uh, uh, weights are actually frozen, but then uh, for the target domain, what we do is, um, in addition to the original, you know, training objective, we also try to minimize the di difference in the distribution of the encoder representations. That can, uh, so this is like a minimizing, um, um, uh, trying to align two distributions. And there are multiple metrics that you can use. You can use multi uh, mean discrepancy error or you know pullback lever div divergence there are a lot of metrics in the literature we we just found that you know junction channel divergence which is the symmetric version of the pullback lever divergence provided the best result um the, uh, for our case there was a paper that used uh you know uh, pullback lever divergence and we actually gained some uh, better results compared to that so that was the reason for using that some other design considerations is that since we are using data augmentation uh, we don't need any uh, dedicated um, regularization, like dropout is not needed. And actually it interferes to some extent. And same thing happens with batch normalization uh, uh, that uh, because your, your data statistics actually, it's a stochastic augment, augmentation. So the data statistics vary quite a bit. So the batch normalization actually have a tough time catching up. So we had to get rid of batch normalization and use like a self normalization, normalizing activation functions. And also the augmentation parameters need to be chosen very carefully and in this particular order to have a stable set of augmentations. Uh, that was one thing that we had trouble, uh, you know, 
when developing uh, this network. So here are the details of the model um, and evaluation. Um, we can revisit the details later if we uh, have more time. Um, and these are the results. So this is the result for single domain with limited labels. We um, plot the results for both dance activity recognition and HHAR dataset, which is a public dataset on uh, ADL data. And we, um, we use unlabeled data um, or turn off the uses of the unlabeled data. And then we also turn on and off the augmentation um, uh, pipeline to see which actually provides uh, what. So what we actually understood is that augmentation helps more in specialized uh, such as dance activities than other natural ADL ones. And it actually provides up to 5% improvement with 50% or less labeled data. On the other hand, our self-supervision uh, module pro uh, provides up to 2% boost in most cases. Now, coming back to our domain adaptation scenario. Now, as we have said, like um, to, um, to understand what happens if you have limited um, uh, labeled samples, even in the source domain, we fixed uh, the label number of labeled samples to 50% in the source domain, and then we have varied the number of um, labeled samples in the um, target domain from um, zero to 100 percent. And um, we, um, you know, we actually plot the ac um, accuracy across, uh, you know. The whole, um, um, I'm sorry, there was a notification noise coming and, you know, it distracted me. Um, um, okay, let me rephrase. Yeah, so we plotted everything um, um, uh, in a graph and we compare our, our uh, results again, SDCNN and DDC, which are, uh, um, which were state of the art back at that time and had comparable design choices to us. So that's why we wanted to compare against them. And we saw that OctoAct consistently shows an average of 5% improvement. So in summary, we presented a self-supervised feature learning from unlabeled, self-supervised method of feature learning from unlabeled data, and our semi-supervised activity classification uh, method with only 6% of the label samples can retain over 80% accuracy. Uh, it can also retain 90% accuracy if you provide up to 20 five percent of the samples in both specialized and natural activity recognition tasks and our semi-supervised domain adaptation method um, the contribution was the novel domain normalization and uh, adaptation i think i skipped the part of the domain normalization so we can uh, revisit that um, later um, so our uh, our domain adaptation module can retain 89% accuracy target domain with 50% label samples in both source and the target domain. However, the main problem that we face during this uh, uh, designing of this work is that the augmentation parameters, we actually needed to, you know, be very careful with a very, um, very, very stable, to have a very stable augmentation and not do like very high amount of like change in the data um, now the question is that becomes like a, um, um, you know, domain knowledge, like say human knowledge driven thing. And we said like, this is not an elegant design. So the question was, is there a way to learn this transformation automatically? And also we did not uh, handle like positional or any other heterogeneities only focused on personal. So that was also something that we wanted to uh, address in our next piece of work. So how do we handle positional and personal heterogeneities without labeled samples? So idea is that instead of doing random uh, transformation, can we learn an optimum set of transformations with machine learning? So we are again trying to be a little bit lazy, right? So the idea is apply transformations on data that differs from what we have already seen during the training. And also the benefit is that we don't want to retrain the classifier because say in a lot of scenarios, like practical scenarios, you might have say a lot of unlabeled data lying around, but if you need to retrain the classifier, that means you have to go back and, you know, collect label samples. You might not have that if you are, you know, um, building something, uh, uh, you know, uh, by using an off the shelf classifier, right? 
so so that is uh, that is the motivation for designing this framework that is triangle so as you can see uh, you you already you already if you have a source domain classifier that say that was trained from like label samples you have this thing and then from unlabeled data you um we we would use an automatic transformer that will that will be that we are calling spatial transformer and then it would transform those samples so that the distribution would be similar to what the source domain classifier was originally expecting so if you match the distribution then actually it can classify without any problems now the question becomes that okay i can uh, i will do all the um, um, i can do all those augmentations or transformations but how do i actually um, represent all those type of rotation scaling or shear or translation in a compact way and it turns out that if you take a um, uh, if you uh, open up a computer graphics or uh, computational geometry book you will actually learn that you know any combination of rotation scaling shear and translation uh, these are all uh, this all fall under affine transformation and any one of them or any combination any series of combinations can be represented by a 12 parameter matrix that is a theta so that's the compact representation of all affine transformations now you can say if you want to translate by a factor of uh, t and scale by a factor of s you can just put those values here and you can actually uh, have your um, you know transform matrix Similarly, if you want to do a rotation, it can be done, but we don't, we don't want to do it manually. We want the network to learn it, right? So the idea is very simple that um, we just uh, take the unlabeled samples. This is the you know um, idea de detailed down here that you scrutinize the unlabeled samples, BT, with a localization network, L, and regress the four by three parameters for transformation. So you take a look at the data and you predict what would be the optimum transformations. And since that is a transformation matrix, so you multiply again the data that you got with that transform, uh, transformation matrix, get, get your transformed samples. Now, how do you get uh, to decide that this is a, a good set of transform, uh, transformed samples? You can just say, okay, uh, you can create another uh, neural network that will be a discriminator and differentiate between uh, the original BS and the transformed samples and the provide the gradients for training. Now, as you have already guessed, this T and D together form a generative adversarial network. And once you have trained it, the inference is actually pretty simple. You just pass the data through the uh, generator or the T network and then use that transformed data for the classification. Now, if, if we agree that this is a generative adversarial network, then we can actually directly plug in the generator loss and discriminator loss from the vanilla gun paper. But what we observed is that since um, we are not using any labels um, for this transformation, that the T network can actually cheat. Say uh, it can take, it can uh, learn a small set of transformations to a very specific label space. Say you give a lot of data like running, uh, jumping or whatever, but it just maps it to say um, uh, sitting still on the couch uh, on, of the source domain and it could actually fool the discriminator. And this actually collapses our training. And in the GAN literature, this is, uh, uh, I think it's uh, referred to as mode collapse. So in our case, I mean, there are different ways to do that in uh, GAN literature, but we found a very simple solution that was novel is that apply transformation on only on the heterogeneous or target samples and leave the original source samples alone. So the generator network also needs to learn the representation of the source samples. And you can do it with a simple reconstruction objective. So if anything that looks like source, don't just, uh, uh, just reconstruct it. Don't just uh, mess with it. Anything that looks different, only transform that. So that is the, um, whole idea summarized and we actually summarize that in this algorithm but we can revisit that if you have any questions later and also the layer designing needs needs to have um, careful considerations because we are uh, talking about affine transformations so um, you cannot just treat channels as uh, sorry um, like accelerometer channels as a channel in a convolutional network because uh, the channels are actually permutation invariant 
Um, so you need to be careful with that because if you do a, a multiplication by a uh, 90 degree uh, patient that basically actually shifts two channels. So the localization network needed a little bit of careful uh, um, design that we perfected over, over time. But then you can actually see that after this look, it, it, it is still a convolutional architecture. It just regresses 12 parameters that is actually applied to the input again to uh, gain the output. And if you are familiar with, uh, you know, attention mechanisms, uh, the localization network can be interpreted as an attention mechanism where the key and query lies because it, it starts from the input sample. Uh, the convolution will take care of that. And then the, uh, that result is actually apply to the input sample that can be interpreted as a value. The discriminant network is much simpler. It's just a, a binary classifier. And here are the details of uh, model and evaluation. Uh, since it's a, a, a generative adversarial network, we actually had to resort to a lot of tricks uh, of stabilizing GAN, but we were finally be uh, able to um, you know, uh, achieve sta stable results. So let's talk, um, compare against the other baselines. So state of the art baselines require retraining or joint updating of the classifier, which we do not need. Uh, we, uh, they actually require constant access to source domain samples. We all actually don't need that. Uh, if you have a pre-trained classifier, then we can actually work with unlabeled samples from both source and the target domain. So our, from that perspective, if you have a, uh, already pretrained classifier, then our model is totally unsupervised. You can say that. Though, because they are actually uh, retraining the classifier, they are also computationally inefficient. They also require paired samples like this, this framework. They also have privacy concerns and they lack any interpretability. So ours is the network that actually handles all these cases without uh, you know, um, compromising uh, much. So this is the results for cross-body position transfer on PAMAP2 data set. And as you can see, we, we received 5% improvement. Uh, in uh, opportunity data set, we also received 4% improvement. And this is still against an paired sample, whereas we are unpaired. So that network actually, DGD actually falls pretty sharply if you do not give them uh, paired samples. On a cross-person transfer, the result is much more nuanced and sorry, much more muted. And we only receive 5%, sorry, 1.5% improvement. And we think that there are some explanations in why this is happening. So the reason is, what we think is that um, since Stranger, Stranger actually has a stronger inductive bias that all these uh, transformations between uh, part, across persons or body positions are affine in nature, and we receive better results when um, you know, position specific, it leads us to speculate that position specific heterogeneities are more affine in nature. Also, the label distribution might affect our results because when we are doing cross position heterogeneity, um, if you collect unlabeled data, still the, for, from the same person with two different positions, the uh, label distribution will same. We have the assumption that the label distribution would be same and that's why probably it works well, but say for a cross person transfer, if you collect unlabeled data, one person might have like a, might have run like 10 minutes longer than the other person. And because of the sample, uh, sorry, label distribution mismatch, uh, there is no way um, for us to actually, you know, handle that because we do not actually use the labels actually during our transfer process. Um, uh, we also have some results on the interpretability that we uh, alluded before. Since these are the transformation matrix, they can be actually traced back to their individual um, individual um, um, trans, um, transformations. For example, we take the um, data, source and target domain data, plot their distribution uh, with overlap, and you can actually see that there is a much, uh, there is a higher overlap between source and target uh, after you have done the domain adaptation. And if you, these are the distribution plots of the parameter um, values. And if you, you, if you look closely, this right column is actually uh, um, related to the translation. So you can actually some trace a little bit that, you know, this peak was actually shifted on the left, whereas these two peaks, these green peaks were shifted on the right. And you can see that there's a negative 
um, value and these are the two positive values a little bit uh, negative or po uh, positive not too much um, also you can see that uh, there is a scaling effect for example this this one was uh, you know scaled back to uh, a, a very smaller value and you can actually see that there is a 0.7 value on the you know scale parameter but however i cannot tell this with like uh, um, full certainty because this is a composite uh, transformation matrix so it is uh, it would not be right to say that this is totally just scale because uh, this is part of some shear or some other operation that is more complex so and one way to have more interpretability is to have a multi-stage generator model where each stage is explicitly structured to learn parameters of individual operation it would be more interpretable but then this since this is a discrete search space it would require a reinforcement learning policy optimization uh, and uh, we think that since we are actually targeting like um, you know wearable devices it might not be worth the uh, i mean it might be worth investigating but we were wondering at that point what would be the best way so we think that stangen provides a nice trade off between the learning complexity inference speed and interpretability so some concessions were made and we also took a deeper look at the um, the gamma parameter on the reconstruction loss and you, as you can see without that reconstruction loss if you set the gamma parameter to pretty low the model actually collapses pretty well oh, sorry pretty pretty much so it need, actually needs a higher value of gamma to actually um you know do the trans uh, formation and uh, this is something that you know one of the hyperparameters of our model that dictates the performance of the total uh, ar um, total architecture so some other discussion points since we have we do not actually modify the classifier and also we do not uh, we just directly take unlabeled samples so it does provide some privacy preserving alternative or complementary features to federated learning our model is not susceptible to poisoning attacks or you know um, also it reduces the computational overhead by not requiring the model update but we are not saying that this is a uh, you know alternative to federated learning it's like a complementary approach but it's nice to have also we think that um although we are doing good in small adls if your activity we itself requires like a very large window say cooking or cleaning house those kind of like you know and the definition can vary between like uh, different households right so for those activities uh, our smaller window might not be appropriate we need to increase the window but then it actually creates a another set of challenges which i can discuss later if you have questions on this uh but at this moment we have like a small window and that uh limits us from expanding onto much more complex activities uh, we also think that since we assume that the uh, transformation needs to be as uh, affine the we we do not think that it will be good for a sensor heterogeneity mitigation because sometimes the sensors will clamp the signals because of uh, a small uh, uh, sorry lower sensitivity. But if um, you know the samples are just uh, um, yeah, so that's that's why we don't do it. And also like we are not doing any random uh, jitter or that kind of thing. That can also happen. Like you know, so those are much more spiky changes. So I think we think that this is not a um, good fit for that kind of heterogeneity and as i said the label distribution mismatch is one of the achilles heel in our, our network design architecture so in summary we built a decoupled interpretable domain adaptation method to mitigate personal and positional heterogeneity without any paired samples and achieved state-of-the-art result however still uh, this architecture is limited by one heterogeneity at a time that we are only doing position or person not both of them at the same time we have not done that in this uh, work and also what if we want to adapt from multiple sources say your in input data can have say um, you, you might have data from um, ankle and a chest sensor but you want to adapt that to a wrist sensor so multi-source capability is another thing that we should be able to handle which we try to uh, handle in our next piece of work and it so the our how to handle complex mixture of domain space heterogeneities um so let's do a backtrack uh 
uh, for one minute. Traditional classification approach will the objective is to learn the mapping between data and labels, right? And we already proposed two solutions, and there are numerous other competing solutions that uses domain adaptation or uh, you know unsupervised or self-supervised representational learning. However, in all of these approaches, one thing we notice is that the metadata or domain level information is actually severely underutilized. Like yes, I mean Strangan and including other domain adaptation methods, they use that this domain label, right? Say when you are saying that I want to um, transfer transfer from one person's data to another person's data, uh, sorry, a model or one position to another position, you implicitly assume that there is some domain label information, right? That is the, I mean, and that comes from the data because the data is annotated with those informations, right? Now, but we are still doing one domain at a time or single source at a time, right? There must be a holistic way to utilize all of this information, um, this metadata, or to some extent, since if someone can also provide some human knowledge, those become like semantic information. So those might, must be, we, there must be a way to integrate those. And we wondered whether actually it would improve the classification performance. So the intuition is that learning Y given X and the subject device and position encoding would instead instead of, uh, would provide better results compared to just learning Y given X. So that is the main uh, intuition for the, the next piece of work. So what is uh, the conventional way of doing it? Okay, um, yeah, you, you use multitask learning. Like, you know, yeah, uh, have a shared feature extractor and classify the, um, classify the labels and also classify the domain. And based on the relationship that you assume, I mean, in a simple multitask learning, which I refer to as cooperative, um, you assume that you know classification of both of them together will increase your accuracy. There is another hypothesis that that you know there is a you need to learn a domain invariant representation, and this this also assumes that a domain classification will degrade the classification um, accuracy. So there is a normally a gradient reversal layer is actually used to improve uh, to, to receive that domain invariant representation. But as I will show later in the results section, that neither actually produces better performance than simple classification baseline. And we asked ourselves why. Um, and our hypothesis is that the two tasks are neither globally cooperative or adversarial. So this global uh, assumption is uh, uh, it might be wrong. Like you, it might be the case that for one person um, transferring from one person to another. The, um, there might be a um, cooperative relationship that like say, oh, that person's uh, um, walking is similar to mine, whereas in another person's feature, if you're trying to um, achieve, uh, sorry, um, you, you are trying to bring in, you might want to say, you know what, this is so dissimilar, I want to have the domain invariant representation. So it needs to be done case by case basis. You cannot have a global assumption, right? So, um, let the model decide when it knows a sample is coming from a wrist of a female or a sample coming from an ankle of a male and use the information or discard it as long as it increases the final classification accuracy. So the, let the model decide. Let's not us decide. Uh, again, try to be a little bit more lazy. Uh, so this is the idea that we came up with. Um, is, it, uh, is it possible to learn a complex parse sample interaction between the domain space and the label space in a hyperparameter free setup? So the idea is that have separate uh, feature extractors for domain and activity classification. These are the uh, you know domain embeddings and these are the activity embeddings. And features should have geometric embedding characteristics that similar labels should coalesce into close neighborhood and different ones should stay apart. And we should learn a unique encoding for each of the domain and then condition the activity embedding on the pretend uh, 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 domain embeddings, and then when when you have a tuned activity embedding that is capable of handling the domain heterogeneities, train a classifier on top of that. So how do we do that? Oh, before you go, uh, let's just uh, talk about some of the proposed benefits. We already talked about multi-source and multi-heterogeneity. Uh, Hyperparameter-free is also a requirement because 
if you have say say i just showed three dom uh, domain heterogeneities together you might have five or six based on the metadata label information now then you will end up having like say six or seven classification heads and you need to figure out the relative uh, strength of uh, you know the hyperparameters between those classification heads and that can become a nightmare if you have more than two um there are loss balancing uh, techniques that are in the literature but then you know again that becomes a, another uh, struggle but what if we could do that by ourselves the model will learn by itself what to do right uh, so we learn the type and strength of the relationship with the domain and activity space we already talked about it and also since if you decouple uh, the domain embedding learning and the activity embedding learning then you can learn this from labeled samples okay fine but this part can be totally learned from unlabeled samples like it will still need to have the domain labels but you can go about collect the data you create a data set of all the uh, you know with all the domain labels but you still do not need to create and manually annotate each of the activities as long as you infuse this information into your um, activity classification later on so how to learn a unique encoding of each of the domain we use um, a simple uh, contrastive central loss um, that allows simultaneous minimization of interclass variability and maximization of interclass separability. And uh, so let's take a deeper look onto the each of the how we learn the, each of the embeddings. So um, activity embedding is very simple, as I have already talked. Uh, just minimize the distance and maximize the distance of dissimilar ones. Minimize the sim similar ones, and each activity gets its unique neighborhood. Uh, or encoding. Similarly, for uh, for user, if you have user label or gender information, you can create, create a user embedding. You can create position embedding, and you can create device embedding if you have those. And then you concatenate all those together, and that gives you the combined domain embedding. Now, how you how do you infuse this information? The idea is, is again pretty simple. Um, okay, let me clarify one thing. The activity embedding was trained with label samples. The domain embedding was trained with unlabeled samples because we don't, I mean, in this, uh, here we are saying that by unlabeled is that no activity label information, but it still has the domain label information. But then once you have that thing trained, you can pass the labeled samples of the activities through that. So you get the corresponding domain embedding for the labeled samples. And then you f figure out a way to infuse that with a domain activity attention block. And what that attention block actually does is that it just takes a projection of our domain encoding vector with a learnable parameter W. Uh, that this, this becomes our query vector. You do a dot product with the key vector that is the you know activity vector itself. You calculate the attention score. You multiply that with the value vector again. Once you have that, now there are two choices you can directly use that or you can say you know you know what probably and what we actually saw is that um directly using that sometimes overwhelms and overwrites a lot of the uh, you know well-trained values say you already have a classification accuracy of 60 percent you don't want to do a negative transfer uh, you only want to learn what is missing so that's why we have in introduced the residual attention connection so the network will actually decide when this information is actually good enough, if it's not, then it will, for a sample, it will just throw it out. Uh, when it provides better better results or better gradients, it will just use it. So that's the reason for residual attention. And this is the summary of the uh, training method. Uh, um, the layer wise details is also presented here. We try to also make it a little bit more, more compact. So we use that quite separable convolution uh, that reduces the number of parameters by 7.3 times. So it is, well capable of being run on wearable devices. Also, uh, you would notice that at the end of the projection layer, we have a feature normalization. And this is one of the reasons that we don't need to actually do a normalized um, dot product um, or scale dot product. Uh, it's already normalized. So that helps us and reduce some computation cost. These are some of uh, the details of um, pre-processing model and training. Um, we needed to use a larger batch size to have a faster convergence for the contrastive center loss. Uh, we are gonna use macro F1 score. And also since we're talking about the quality of the embeddings, we actually use mill silhouette coefficient 
to measure how uh, the embeddings uh, are one embedding is better than the other because we because it, it visually they are actually um, very difficult to, to uh, actually discern um, uh, by the eye and yeah and for the baselines we compare with uh, like uh, as I have already uh, you know talked about like uh, single task learning and also cooperative and adversarial multitask learning we deliberately do not uh, compare with any domain adaptation because this is a complementary approach rather than a replacement and also we are only focused on um, exploring the effect of auxiliary supervision uh, maybe in, in our extended version of the work we will uh, explore the other um, compatibility with other domain adaptation methods and so the results are um, uh, um, as follows um, first, we try to uh, see whether the contrast with central loss actually provides any benefit, and we see that it actually improves the, um, both the macro F1 score and silhouette coefficient, and actually validates our intuition of using contrastive learning. And then we actually uh, compare that single task with a multitask learning model, and you would see that in with that that global cooperative, uh, sorry, global assumption that the tasks are either um, cooperative or adversarial on a global level is actually ill suited to integrate auxiliary supervision from the metadata labels. And um, interestingly, if you add more of them together, it actually degrades more, at least in uh, you know cooperative MTL model. Um, so we 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 need to have the local part sample learn representation. And um, if you take a comparison with CODEM with the multitask and signal task, you would see that program actually outperforms all the baselines. And on average, all across the data set, it achieves like average 9.5% improvement. And also just to remind you, we are working with this joint set of samples, whereas the multitask learning were trained with same set of samples. Like in one sample would have both the domain and activity labels. Whereas in our case, um, part of the network was trained with like domain label, part of the network was trained with uh, activity labels, and there was total disjoint between these two sets. So that is very encouraging uh, uh, news for us. So we do another visual analysis, and we see that compared to single test learning, our embedding is actually much better because of the extra domain information. And you can you can actually see it is difficult to see from this picture, and that's why the silhouette coefficient comes in. We actually have a higher silhouette coefficient, and um, but if you look closely there, you would see that the lying down, standing up, standing down, and standing up these four um, activities uh, actually have a higher amount of overlap uh, lying down from standing or, or like um, this is a short form of the uh, uh, label so it's uh, more confusing i guess um, but if you take a look at the um, um, confusion matrix you would see what's happening and uh, you can see that all the other ones which are not confused with each other they have high uh, uh, F1 score, but these four activities are confused with each other and the result is pretty bad. But then if we use that domain embedding that we have created, it we for these four sam four uh, data labels, sorry, uh, for these four activity labels, we ac actually achieve up to 35% higher uh, F1 score. So um, some of the future direction that we want to pursue is that we want to do a cross data set experiment which we did not do it's still disjoint but cost data set would be uh, better um you can also raise some privacy concerns that you know because we are learning identity gender information so there is a um, inherent um you know concern with that uh, we we only learn that as a part of the in, uh, in uh, intermediate step in our network um so it should not it does not give a direct exposure but yes, the concern can can remain. I mean, someone might just use part of the network. So that's something we are concerned about. Um, in summary, we built a novel um, framework to exploit metadata information to handle multiple heterogeneity with limited label samples. And it was hyper parameter free with pre-trained domain embeddings. Uh, and also we combined contrastive learning with a residual attention mechanism to learn compact representation that results in uh, almost 10% improved, improved F1 score over the baselines. So to summarize all of our contribution together, in Happy Feet, we curated our own data set to build a simple uh, convolutional classifier, uh, just uh, try out with the heterogeneities and see what, what's happening. 
In OctuAct, we moved on to um, building more robust classifiers with unlabeled samples, and we, we tried handling personal heterogeneity. In Strangan, we moved even further and we built a decoupled interpretable domain adaptation method to mitigate the personal and positional heterogeneity without any paired samples. In Infodem, we actually handle complex heterogeneity mixture with retained domain embeddings. So some of the future works that I have in mind, uh, we only focused on uh, domain embeddings, but there is a way to actually, um, sorry, domain heterogeneity, but there can be label space heterogeneity. Something I discussed in my um, um, proposal, but then, you know, due to lack of time, I, I am, I was decided that we would actually stop there, but I have that in the appendix section if you want to discuss that. I am also interested in uh, exploring disentanglement and pose estimation from the sparse accelerometer streams and some other improvements in Actuax, Tangent, and Codem. And this is the summary of my PhD journey so far. Uh, you know, I joined uh, this um, UMBC in 2016. I was assigned in a different project back then, but uh, that um, I was always um, I, I was wasn't particularly motivated in that type of project. So in, I was able to switch to uh, Dr. Roy's lab in 2018. I also passed the comprehensive exam exam, and um, you know, Happy Feet got accepted in um, 2018 um, in Hot Mobile, and actually it got some media attention as well. Um, um, the extension got accepted in 2019. Um, the Octoac paper accepted in EVI movie Kushas in uh, the same year. Um, 2020 was very um, challenging year. Uh, we submitted uh, our Strangan paper in IMWT. It got a major revision and it got like a huge laundry list of tasks that actually it took us. Um, we actually redid it a lot of part of the experiment to satisfy those reviews. But then they actually rejected our paper uh, again. So, um, you know, it's a lot of work uh, uh, got wasted. But then uh, we submitted that paper in 2021 in IEEE Chase, and uh, it actually got the best paper award this time. So, silver lining. Um, in 2020, I also did an internship with Amazon uh, where I built robust neural machine translation models for Amazon Prime. It was mainly using adversarial data augmentation techniques. Um, in 2021, I also interned with Microsoft Research, where I built robust piece quality uh, assessment models for multi uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, and the manuscript was actually submitted in uh, Interspeech, and we are still re um, awaiting review. Uh, Codem was accepted a few months ago in SmartCom. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, I, um, I received a full time offer from Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta. Um, and um, if I graduate successfully today, <laughs> uh, I will actually join. Um, I have decided that I will take up the offer from Amazon and join uh, their team uh, next month. So that concludes uh, my um, yeah my uh, presentation. These are the publications that I had so far. These are the past author manuscripts, um, and also these are some of the uh, you know uh, papers that we I um, you know my uh, I have uh, collaborations with my lab members i am eternally grateful for their continued support uh, for making me part of their research endeavors uh, and thank you all um, uh, you know um, to my for, uh, current and former lab members uh, you know especially srini obijoy um, zahid and our former lab members uh, sajjad hafiz and nilabro i learned a lot of lot from you guys and especially, of, of course, uh, I, I would not be here without Dr. Roy and Dr. Mishra, without your constant guidance and all those kind, you know, uh, gestures of, you know, teaching. I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful and uh, I enjoyed my journey so far. So, yeah, that concludes my presentation. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you, Jair. Okay, so now we'll open the floor uh, for the questions.